it's good to come and pray to the Lord and turn to him in prayer. We'll do that now. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for your amazing grace. Oh, when we consider all that we deserve in our lives that we never receive, Lord, we are so grateful for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that the sun shines on the unrighteous and the righteous alike. Your rain comes to both. You provide both with food and with water and with the necessities of life, Lord. There are so many things you give to us that we don't deserve. Lord, you give it to those who withhold their wealth from others and from those who are poverty-stricken. You give unto them the blessings too. Lord, we thank you for this, that is, amazing grace. The grace that gives us, Lord, salvation, even though we don't deserve it. Well, we have to confess again today, Lord, that we are sinners and we have fallen short of your standards, even though we have attempted and tried to keep the word of God and to apply it unto our lives, yet, Lord, we cannot uh, meet its standards of our own strength. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit that has been with us, that has enabled us to do so many things, Lord, in a way that pleases you and does honor you. Yet, Lord, even in this we have shown our weakness, Lord, in comparison with the glory of yourself. And yet, Lord, you have accepted the weakness of our being. Lord, you've made your glory shine forth in spite of all these things. And Lord, that men and women might see, we are not saved by works. But Lord, we are saved by grace. And we thank you, Lord, that it is a grace that will sustain us in every part of our lives. Lord, it sustains us when we have nothing. It sustains us when we have everything, it seems. But Lord, it sustains us as we begin life. It sustains us when we end life. Whatever part of life we're in, your grace is sufficient. And Lord, we thank you for the knowledge of this grace, but the experience of it is far greater. Lord, we pray that you would help us to share your grace with others. Lord, even in giving a cup of cold water to someone in need, or visiting them when they are in the condition of needing a visit, Lord, whatever the circumstance, that we may do all things as unto the Lord. Lord, that we may demonstrate the grace of God. Lord, that we may have the opportunity to speak of that grace too. Lord, that people may know that this is not something we flippantly talk about as something we feel. But Lord, it is the truth that is found through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son into the world. that We might receive what we do not deserve. Lord, we were condemned already. But Christ came to redeem us from what we deserved. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done and what you are doing. We pray, Lord, as we look into your word again tonight, you will rejoice our hearts at the abundance of your grace. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we turn to Romans chapter 5, and verses 18 to 21. Romans chapter 5, verses 18 to 21, in which we find the abundance of grace. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteousness, righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless his word. So as I say, we're looking at the abundance of grace this evening. And at verse 20, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, certainly centers our thoughts tonight. As we remember where we've come from so far in chapter 5 particularly, we find that those who receive an abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. That's Paul's verse just preceding these that we're looking at this evening. 
And so far in this chapter, Paul has reminded the Christian that they have received reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ. This has transformed their lives now. They have a different relationship to death. They are no longer going to die in the way they were, but they have been given life in Christ. Therefore, death is but a a doorway through which the Christian passed. It has no victory over them, no strength over them. It also shows that their relation to sin has been changed because the strength of death is sin, that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But, But sin has been dealt with. And because we have been justified in Christ. And in God's sight, we are as if we had never sinned. And So our relation to sin in this world has changed. And God has done that for us. And now as Romans 5 draws to a conclusion, the Apostle Paul draws attention to the abundance of grace now evident in the Christian's life. The first thing we note of this grace, there are two things we'll note of it. The first is it's transforming grace. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. In verse 18 of chapter 5, the Apostle Paul points out that we enter the world where because of one man's offense, we would all face judgment for our actions. We wouldn't face the judgment of Adam's sin. We would face the judgment of our own sin. A judgment which would result in our own condemnation. For anyone looking at our lives, even amongst our friends, our colleagues, and those around us, will have to will find things that are we do wrong, that do not meet their standards, let alone God's standards. And we know that we would fall short and we would face that judgment and condemnation. Judgment not based on the sins of others, but the evidence of our own unrepentant actions continuing the sin of Adam, for he disobeyed the word of God, and so we of ourselves would continue to do so, was it not for the grace of God and the change that he has done. So by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous, but Paul points out we enter the world where we were condemned. Verse 19, though, he says, even so. These are wonderful words, these short phrases at times. The word but at so many times conveys that, and here it is even so. Through the actions of Jesus Christ, who performs the righteous act, as Paul terms it here, through which the free free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. The offense of Adam was to take the forbidden fruit of a tree of the knowledge of good and evil back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, by which death and the awareness of sin entered the world. Adam and Eve took of the fruit of the tree. They knew they were naked. They were ashamed of that nakedness. God was not ashamed of it. They were ashamed of it. They were ashamed of it because they looked at one another differently as a result of their sinful intents and thoughts for one another. The righteous act here is different to that offense, though. The righteous act is that Christ has died for us, as Paul has pointed out in verse 8. And in Philippians 2 and verse 8, Paul describes that more fully. He says, Being found in appearance of man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is the righteous act of which the Apostle Paul is writing. And through that one action, combined with the righteousness of his life in which he did not sin, God saves us, saving us by his life. Here in Romans 19, then, that is described as the justification of life. That Jesus Christ lived a perfect life and exchanged that, put that in the sinner's place, that the sinner might be counted as if they were Christ. Therefore, we are justified, the justification of life. And God has chosen to appoint that justification to us. So if Satan should come, that he doesn't now and has no place to come and condemn us before God, God would say to him, this person is like unto my son. 
they are justified in him. There is nothing you can say. There is nothing you can point to. There is nothing that you can bring before me that, does, that I will take into account against them because they are justified in my son. The true Christian lives their lives then knowing that when they stand in God's judgment, they will do so without any condemnation for their sins. They will not fear to be there because God will make them not fear. He has justified them in that way. And it has come through one man's actions, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is transforming grace. But the second thing we note of it is abounding grace. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. That's one of the lines in the Bible that many people underline and to keep mark to remind themselves of what it is that God makes available. In verse 20, when God, Paul writes, when God instructed his people with the law, the abundance of their offenses became apparent. At the Mount of Sinai, the people were afraid because God's presence was seen in the thunder and the lightning upon the mountain of Sinai, and they heard God speak to them, and they said to Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore. You speak to us, and we'll do whatever God says. And in the process of their days at the Mount of Sinai, God gave unto Moses the law. And for the first time, the standards of God were written down. And they could understand what it meant to be in a relationship with God and what that relationship demanded of them, how they should live. Their marriages, their family, their work, their offerings, their sacrifices, all that they were to do. And their sin suddenly became more abundant. They realized that things that they hadn't considered to be sinful were now sinful. Not because... uh, they weren't before, but because God had revealed it. That's how the law works. It, it teaches us of our sinfulness and our, our need. But where sin abounded in the past, even there, grace abounded much more. When God gave the law which revealed their sinfulness, God at the very same time said to Moses, here's the instructions for the tabernacle. I am going to dwell in the midst of these people. These people whose sin I have revealed with the law, I am going to dwell amongst them. And through grace, God was not going to give them what they deserved. There would be times when they would rebel against God and they would feel something of the wrath in the midst of the camp. But so many people continually, day by day, received the grace of God, knowing that God was in the midst of them. And through sacrifices, which they brought to the tabernacle and were offered there daily by the high priest, God demonstrated that he intended to bring them even nearer to himself. That there would come a time when the the tabernacle would no longer be necessary. But God would dwell with them completely. As Moses had the privilege of speaking to God face to face, as it were, so they one day would have that. And this would come by making available an abundance of grace. Wherever sin has abounded then, wherever the law of God has revealed the sinfulness of men, and where people can see that as a result of looking into the word of God and the things of a nation and all that is occurring, we find in the scriptures grace abounds much more. Brings us then to verse 21. Thus, the Apostle Paul then describes two truths that dwell side by side in this world. Now, I think we all know what a railway track looks like, even if we are not into trains and uh, wanting to play with them. You see, on the railway track, there are two tracks. There are two pieces of track that are joined together by uh, what are called sleepers. At least that's what they were called in when I remember learning about it. And, but there are these two tracks. The train travels on those two tracks. And here, as it were, these two truths are two tracks. But they are distinct. There is a right-hand track, there is a left-hand track, and you can't bring those two together. They are distinct. And here are two truths. They travel to the very same destination. They travel along life's way, as it were. The first truth, or the first track, if you want to call it that, 
is that sin reigns in death for those without Christ. And that is true of many in this world tonight. That is the truth. That is their life. Sin is reigning in them, and death will indeed be their end. Not as they think of it, the terminal end of leaving this world, but actually true death, which is described in the Scripture as the second death, which we enter, would enter into hell, which we deserve of our own doing, not because God is God alone, but because we have offended a holy God and we deserve to be there. That is the first truth. The second truth is, this other line, is that there are those who are accompanied by grace in this life. That is the grace that, but that grace, unlike the sin that terminates a death, uh, that, that terminates with death, grace does not terminate a death. Grace continues on. The other truth, this truth reigns through righteousness. And this grace cannot be overcome. God has purposed that these that those who receive this grace are brought to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there are those two tracks. Sin leading to death. We should all be on that track. That should be what carries us through into life to death and face the judgment of God and be dismissed into death, the eternal death forever, away from him, yet knowing of his holiness in the wrath that we experience because of the sins that we have committed and the unrepentedness that we continue to have in that place. But there is this other track of grace under which God places his people and it does not terminate. It does not end. It flows through into eternity and those who are upon this track, as it were, enter into eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the means. Instead of death, is Christ that we have entered through. So the Apostle Paul is speaking then of this abundance of grace. And as we think of it, let me give you at least one exhortation here. Paul writes in verse 21, So might grace reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The question here that we come to in the midst of this is, is your life on the right track? Your life on the right track. Your life, one in which you do not want the grace of God. You want as little to do with God as possible. You want to continue to live your own way and your own means. Well, my dear friend, it might feel as if you are living freely and you are doing whatever you want, but the truth is you are as glued to a railway track as the rest of us, as it were. We are all on a journey. We began with birth and we will end with death in this world. And it is a track. And there is no wavering on a railway track, and there is no wavering from this truth. Those on the track of sinfulness and wanting to do our own thing in our own way, we end up on that track, and it terminates at death, and it brings us to the death. Not the right track to be on. There are those of us who are beside you who are on another track. The grace of God has abounded towards us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We deserve everything that you are heading for in and of ourselves. But God in Christ has transferred us into the kingdom of his Son and has chosen to provide unto us not only the forgiveness of our sins, but the abundance of his grace. That we should not only receive forgiveness in this life and eternal life, but all the blessings of Christ forever through grace. We will never deserve to be in heaven of ourselves, but it is by the grace of God. Paul also makes this point. It is an abundance of grace. An abundance of grace that is available to everyone who would call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. This abundance of grace means that it is there is sufficient grace for anyone to have eternal life. Scriptures say, though we, our sins be like scarlet, if we had committed the most heinous of crimes of murder, yet there can be forgiveness with God. 
not because anyone deserves, but because of the grace of God. That is how a king like David, who committed adultery, murdered his, uh, the lady he laid with, his, her husband, who brought so much death within his kingdom as a result of his actions before God. That's how a man like him can know that he's forgiven. It was not because he was a good man. It was because he was a man who knew great grace. Dear friend, no matter how bad you might feel about your sin, there is nothing, if God is pleading with you to trust and believe in him, that can keep you from this eternal life if you would but trust in him. Don't believe the devil's lie that there is some amount of sin that you can keep between you and the grace of God. If God is offering you grace, the devil has no place in the conversation except the abundance of the grace of God. It is sufficient. The Apostle Paul speaks of himself as having a thorn in the flesh. My mind certainly wanders to thinking of all the things that Paul did in his life. He was a cruel man when he was a Jewish believer. He hated the Lord Jesus Christ. He hated the disciples of Christ. And he did some terrible things which he regretted in his life. And that would certainly be some means that the enemy would use against him to accuse him and say, look what you've done. Look at that person. Remember that face. Remember that cry. The Lord said unto him, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. That's the abundance of grace, dear friend. We might struggle with all the things we've ever done, all the things that we've ever carried out and be reminded through cries that we hear in our dreams or, or things that we remember and faces that we remember and things we have done. My dear friends, the grace of God is sufficient. It is abundant grace. It is not like the jar of oil which the woman poured out and didn't stop flowing till all the vessels were full. It is more like a Niagara that has no end. It just keeps on flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing. So is the abundance of God's grace. So let that grace enter your heart and into your life. Let that change your relation to sin in this world that you may reign through righteousness. Seek those things which are above. Seek those things which please God. Not because they earn your salvation, but because God provides the strength to live out his salvation in a transformed life. Abundant grace, a wonderful thing.